Many young people in Nigeria and Africa today are earning a large part of the income online. Yes, platform livelihoods extend far beyond conventional gig work to encompass fractional social trade focus and diverse income generating activities. These platform livelihoods are defined by ways in which people earn a living by working, trading, renting, or creating in digital marketplaces, a sector projected to reach $72 billion in Africa by 2026. These platforms are a strong magnet for excluded groups such as youth and women. As these online modes of earning a livelihood expand, there will be a need to invest more in payments infrastructure and robust digital identification systems to fortify the digital landscapes. Of course, this can be fraught with a lot of risks such as cybersecurity and fraud. And if you earn online, why not save online? Well, Microvest is a startup financial technology company whose digital savings platform has helped over 12,000 people cultivate and improve their savings habits. There's no doubt that the total digitization of e-commerce payments and earnings is definitely fraught with cybersecurity risks, even as regulators across many economies attempt to rein in these activities and manage the rapid growth of operators like fintech companies. Today, I'm joined by Professor Olayinka David West, Associate Dean of the Lagos Business School and research partner for the Women in the Platform Economy Study featured in the Platform Livelihoods Project. She's also joined in the studio with me by Chief Operating Officer of Microvest, Yemisi Bode Thorpe, an experienced legal practitioner. Great to have you on the show with Thank me, you, ladies, this morning. And I'm going to start with Professor uh, David West. You conducted this expansion research on platform livelihoods. Uh, this is the total earnings life cycle or life of people online. Uh, can you tell us some of the key findings from that research? Well, I think the research was conducted and um, commissioned by MasterCard Foundation. And the purpose was really around how do we ensure as part of the Digital um, Africa Works program, how do we ensure we can create livelihoods for the youth in Africa? And so they started this project. So we did it in Nigeria, Kenya, and um, Ghana. And the whole idea was how do we ensure that we can actually understand the nuances of platforms and how it affects women in particular. So we did the study and what we found in Nigeria, for example, was that context matters. The environment in which you operate matters. And I think you talked to that earlier on around infrastructure, financial infrastructure, payments infrastructure. Platforms mimic the real world. So the things around social dynamics and cultural norms, they also translate into platforms. For women, we found out that also flexibility is a myth in the sense where, where you believe that, yes, you have these online platforms and you can do it when you want, but working in different time zones, working across and managing your own home care duties and needs, flexibility is a myth. And then, so those were some of the key findings that we looked at. And then globally as well, and within the three countries, we also found out that, you know what, money and earning an income is one of the biggest motivations around platforms. Okay. To manage the flexibility issues, women have, you know, they manage the pros and cons, and they just sort of exist and navigate the, 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 mind, the environment in which they're working. So those are some of the interesting okay. findings. That's, that's really interesting because one of the trends we've seen is that a, long, a lot of the ability to earn online means you can even diversify your income sources and do more than one job at a time, particularly <laughs> in the post-COVID world. So I'm going to come to you, uh, Yemisi, around Microvest. Microvest is really a fintech platform, yes, it's, it's, it's. but that also has... Uh, savings product. Yes. yes uh, right. Do. So are there ways you can even expand your services to work with people like uh, uh, the work and the organizations that Professor David West is doing, where if you earn online, save online oh, and yes. do everything else online. Tell us about what Microvest is doing. Oh, okay. So Microvest was established um, basically to um, build communities of individuals um, who are prosperous and are able to impact the, you know, inner circle, the community, the extended communities, and even the larger world. So, you know, we've created digital platforms to enable people to take charge of their savings habits. And once you have your um, smartphone and you have internet connectivity, you're good to go. So we, we're, we, we are able to embrace as many people, as many users as possible 
Yeah, so you have over 12,000 people now yes. using it. So in terms of transaction actually. volumes, from a volumes perspective, can you quantify it a bit for us? How much has been saved through the Microvest platform? Oh, in hundreds of millions, I would like to say. Dollars or Naira? Naira. In Naira. For now, okay. in Naira, okay. yes, for now. So what is the capacity? What is, you know, how big could this grow to? Oh, it could, it could grow as much as, as, um, as one can think because it's not, we're not limited by time, we're not limited by space. So, the, you know, the, the potential is enormous, actually. So, so why? Why would I save with a microvest as opposed to just opening a traditional savings account in a bank? Oh, okay. So, I mean, we, there, there, there are a lot of reasons. There are many reasons why you save with microvest. First of all, every cobble counts. And then the sort of um, um, bureaucracies that you find in traditional banks where, you know, to open an account and all of that, you open one account for you know, fixed deposits, you open an account for savings. It's different when it comes to microvest. You open one account and then you have multiple products, flexible products, um, more fixed products, and all, all kinds of products that okay. we have. Yes, Interesting. you have access to all, you, you all know, of Professor them. David West, one of the things I've been thinking about, looking at some of the topics we've been talking about on the show, we've been talking about cybersecurity, mm -hmm. we've been talking about fraud. There's now the government looking, mulling this 0.5% levy on electronic transactions mm -hmm. for fintechs and banks for cybersecurity, for the National Cybersecurity Fund. And I'm looking at this expanding platform space mm -hmm. and I'm saying, how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? The people doing good business, doing legitimate business, earning legitimate income, does some of your research show what the trends are around fraud, around cybersecurity, or some of the ill practices going on in that space? Well, you see, I think one thing we need to realize is online environments also mimic digital and um, physical environments, traditional environments, and they will continue to exploit people who are not as savvy in terms of understanding. So some of the trends we've seen around governance, for example, some of the platforms are now realizing that that implicit trust that we assumed doesn't exist. Okay. So we need to do more on platform governance in terms of how do we ensure that the sellers are true sellers and vis-a-vis -vis also the buyers are true buyers in that sense. That's one area. There's also the issue around work and sales transactions. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that these are honored and the agreements are kept in, the, in, the, in terms of the regulatory side as well as the delivery side as well? On the seller side, what we've also found is that the sellers are becoming more social media savvy, they're understanding more, but then the seller environment is also enhanced by the delivery economy because since COVID now, you realize that there's a lot more of delivery services going on and then also packaging solutions. Mm. So you have better packaging solutions around what people can do and what they can take. And then also on the buyer side, there's increased awareness. But then there's not enough awareness, but some of the factors that we see are financial um, barriers as well as digital barriers. So not everybody has a smartphone. How do we ensure that we can take it? And that's why you find out some have a digital strategy mm. where you can start digitally or they call it physically. a digital digital strategy. Okay, that's yes. a new word. I haven't heard that. <laughs> Physical and digital. digital yes, yeah, okay. because b bottom line is that you can walk into a delivery system service, place your order, you don't need to have any devices, and then pay there, and then go back and collect. Mm. And then don't forget that the addressing systems across Nigeria are not really you know, Great. up to date and, yeah. and, and advanced. So where, you know, when you go to a village under the tree, past the post office, or, you know, how do you describe, how do you put that in an address system on Amazon, for example? So we need to address these nuances and ensure that um, we can actually ensure that people have access, pan-Nigeria, urban and rural. Mm. You know, um, a lot has been said about your research around women, and I want us to sort of maybe look at the nuances. It's, Microvest is predominantly a savings platform. Yes, it is. What are some of the trends we're seeing in how women may use or interact with the micro, Microvest? So what are some of the saving, culture, saving cultures that may be you know, idiosyncratic to a to, female saver. Can you tell us a bit about that? Okay, so for, for women, what we've seen is that, yes, I, I always say that women are very good managers of money, but okay. the problem always comes with financial literacy as a whole, where they know the options that are available to them for savings or investments and all that. So there's still a lot to be done in that area because a lot of them are still kind of skeptical. Mm -hmm. So yes, you see, Many more women coming on board now and taking up our products 
you know, based on trust, based on, you know, engagement, one-on-one -on -one engagements. But um, there's still a lot to be done because women are usually more skeptical than men are. And probably a bit more risk averse. Oh, yes. that's, that's the narrative we yes. often hear. Yes, so it. then what are you then doing in the <clears throat> area of digital literacy? Because presumably if you want to build your platform and expand yeah. it in order to grow your market mm -hmm. share, you have to then educate the people who could be potential users. Yes, so we're, we're building um, different products that are targeted towards women. So um, these are still, you know, work in progress, actually, because of the trends that we've seen in recent times, you know, whilst going out in the market and, you know, getting the feedback that we're getting. So we're working on those products to target women, you know, the, the, the things that are peculiar to women, maybe childcare, maybe elderly care and things like that, mm. you know, just trying to bring that to the fore, trying to build those into our products yes. to ensure that we bring more women on board, you know, in an inclusive environment. Yeah, Professor David West, you know, one of the other narratives I've heard a lot, for a lot of sectors, whether it's trade, whatever it is, people have often kind of linked digital to the economic emancipation of women. So whereas in a lot of traditional sectors where women have been excluded and marginalized, it seems like digital and tech has been positioned as the savior of women's of women in terms of economic empowerment. And is this actually working out? Is this the kind of industry that will actually transform the fortunes of Nigerian and African women insofar as business, small and medium sized enterprises are, are concerned? That's a trick question, Rola. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, because I don't think it's a yes or a no. Okay. And I think it's variable depending on the sector and the clusters you're working in. Mm. So I'll give an example of um, some work that was done with women farmers, dairy farmers in the north. And what they found is that the women farmers were you know, they had their cows doing the local production, milk, getting milk every day, but taking the milk to the market, right? And for local products, wara, yogurt, and things. But then a service came together, gathered, aggregated them as a community, mm. and negotiated with a professional, formal producer, dairy producer, processor, to untake their milk. And then basically from taking their milk, they will be paid digitally okay. and into a wallet. And then that did two things. They earned more. And then their husbands didn't have access to their cash. <laughs> <laughs> so they could also now save more. And what we've also found is that, you know, to start your digital journey, mm. it's actually how do you make your money? So if you make your money digitally or you earn money digitally, you're more likely to actually save mm. and use digital products and services. Right. But when that, that conversion or exchange of cash to digital and vice versa also needs to be taken into consideration because, for example, Yemisi is probably looking to, oh, I have people who already have accounts that want to save rather than, okay, how do I go to the woman selling Bali on the streets? Who doesn't and have an account at all. And she's, pay, she's transacting in cash. Mm. So that's where, again, you find out that people like the Baba Alajo are more convenient mm -hmm. because they go door to door. Because don't forget that women won't leave their locations. So they go door to door and they're picking up their, their money and they're providing that service. Mm. So we need to rethink and understand not just the nuances of the women, but the nuances of the environment in which the women are operating. Mm. Almost like a sights and sounds. Yeah. What does the market look like? What does she do? And how, what's a day in the life of this woman? And really understand her journey to be able to build a product that meets not mm. just her financial financial needs, but her social needs, her emotional needs as well. Yeah, and, and indeed, then that research then needs to be specific to the dynamics of each sector. So given all of this that is happening, you know, uh, coming back to regulation, okay. uh, we're seeing over the last week in Nigeria uh, regulatory clampdowns on fintech companies. <laughs> fintech companies are always in the eye on the storm. Let's, you know, all these new disruptive sectors are always in the eye on the storm. For growing and expanding, you know, online savings, digital banks, how do you see yourself as a private sector operator working hand in hand with the regulator to make sure that regulation does not stunt your growth, but actually ends up becoming an enabler? Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you very much for that question. Um, so for, for us, I mean, I, I, the CBN as a regulator has to do its own work. Right. But I would say that the um, stakeholders within the industry must always be carried along so that we don't have the kind of um, policy somersaults that we're experiencing these days. So for us, we, we have no restrictions um, in terms of onboarding. We're still able to, to board and onboard 
you know, new users. We're having more users now than ever before. Mm. Um, we make sure that our compliance is top notch at every point in time so that we don't run afoul of the law at any point in time. So, yes, um, in terms of regulations, in terms of, you know, ensuring that we're on the right side of the law, yes, our KYC is always, you know, the, as, you're, as you're signing up, there are certain levels that you have to get to before you can carry out any mm. transactions. Oh, but why do you <clears> think <throat> the industry as a whole, the fintech and payment services space, has so many perceived or actual vulnerabilities? Why do you think that is? I, I think it's a trust issue, really. Okay. I think, yeah, because a lot of times people are not able to put faces or a physical structure to fintech companies. So there's that bias that where is my money going into? And then once there's an issue, you know, it raises a red flag in the minds of everybody. Mm. So when there's, a, when there's an issue in the broader industry, can yes. then impact other yes, fintech players? Interesting. Others. I'd love to hear your thoughts in terms of online marketplaces and platform economies from a regulatory perspective. Regulations are supposed to be market enablers in a way, right? And again, they're also supposed to protect the market actors as well as the consumers in any market. And when you go into financial services, one of the biggest challenges is the risks. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these risks are still emerging risks because there's different types of risks. The technology itself has certain risks, right? There's integration risks when you're integrating it with different systems. And then there's, you know, so th those are the things we need to understand. And for a regulator, it's like, how do we quantify and assess these risks? Because if the system crashes, mm -hmm. don't forget that the global financial crisis happened somewhere else. But then we saw markets move everywhere and that's what we're trying to avoid mm. and let's understand the nature of the risk and provide proportionate regulation yeah that's, and a that's key the one. word mm. proportionate regulation around the risks on the technology side fintechs are product developers right they want to launch better faster sexier products for example but then again do they understand the nature of the risks what if somebody's money doesn't get you know get to the next destination because what if there's a connection problem a breaking connection and then the money gets missing somewhere that reconciliation process how mm. long does it take to get the money back into the hands we've all lost money from um cannot dispense dispense error and things like that so those are the factors that we need to think about and don't forget that when you're saying something is better how reliable is it how consistent is it how dependable is it so is it better on monday to friday and then saturday and sunday mm. it's offline and things so we need to be considerate around that on the platform and e-commerce side it's really consumer protection right i paid for x did i get y who do i go to and that's where you see the fccpc come in as well nowadays that how do we ensure that we understand the nature of the business the nature of the flows and consumers can get value and not feel that they're being cheated you know you can you know someone said to me one day in some work you can beat up a, a customer service operative you can't beat up an atm <laughs> <laughs> yes and that's why when you if you remember when after the lockdown there was a surge on getting into the financial institutions mm. because people had complaints that hadn't been and resolved. They, they couldn't, there was nobody the, to exactly, do Exactly, yeah. to vent at. You know, so when we had the Naira redesign as well, you saw people going into the banks, stripping and just, you know, causing mm. a riot because they had technically digital money, but they couldn't access their physical cash, yeah. which they needed yeah. for their day-to-day -day lives. Very interesting. And you know, when I think about these issues, uh, I think we have a, a few more minutes to go, you know, if you look at traditional banking uh, from a risk and insurance perspective, most Nigerian consumers know that there's a depositors insurance scheme, right? Yes. Um, for a fintech platform like a uh, like fintech, microvest. Yeah, it, sorry, micro micro <laughs> microvest. <laughs> in the highly unlikely scenario, hopefully that something happens, there's a major systemic risk, and all the fintech collapse. What is the consumer's insurance at that point? <laughs> Okay, so for us, what we've done is to partner with um, a fund management and trust company. Okay. And so that ensures the safety of the funds of, of our, our users and our, and our mm. customers. You know, so the, the, your funds are now lost. You know, so for us, we, and, uh, as well as data and, and you know, your information. 100% guarantee or up to a certain percentage of 100% guarantee. Okay. Yes, it's 100% guarantee. So somebody's taking 100% risk on, yes. Yes, on that. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's that, what, that's, that's how... interesting. Uh, that's, uh, you know, because I've always wondered about <laughs> that. Um, so I, I think finally, you know, all of these solutions that we've been talking about, ultimately they're there to solve a problem. Yes. So notwithstanding the challenges 
and all these things. I'd like to start by asking you, uh, Professor David West, how can platform livelihoods transform economic development in Africa? What is the key problem here that platform livelihoods are, are solving? Well, platform livelihoods are solving access to work, unemployment and underemployment. Okay. So when you look at, for example, digitally enabled work like Uber and ride hailing, a lot of the Uber drivers that you meet are graduates that have been unable to find proper work and need to earn a living. So when you think about it, so what we now talk about is how do we ensure that they're earning a fair wage? How do we ensure that they have protection? So for example, an Uber driver is a daily wage work earn earner, right? Mm. If his car is off the road for three days, that technically means he's not able to earn. Mm -hmm. So what kind of salary protections can he have or benefits? For example, they don't get sick leave, they don't get health care, they don't get anything. So even the, when you think about the elements in which we work in, especially, for example, delivery drivers, there's no rest stop. Right. Mm. So if you notice, they've, they've sort of cluster around different shady areas just for them to be able to have a break and, you know, just take mm. a power nap or something or the other. So we need to think about these economies are here to stay. But then does our social infrastructure cater to these kinds of new economies? Mm. And how do we start to build these out? And how do we start to ensure that really mm. we can provide livelihoods for everybody? Because the, a lot of them earn a, over a living minimum wage, but not all of them earn a living wage, wage. especially in Lagos. So okay. when you think about context, what you happen, you happens in Lagos, how do we grow that and scale that across different Nigerian cities? Abel Kuta, Ibadan, for um, Port Harcourt, because that's where, that's so people also stop this reverse urbanization and, you know, this migration into urban cities when you can work from wherever. Another solution is how do we start thinking around providing good infrastructure in the states, right? So the states can have what the Europeans are doing, digital nomad status. Mm. So you can live in Niger state and you can be working anywhere in the world and you can be earning and um, supporting that economy. Absolutely, and even earning Forex. Exactly. Yeah? <laughs> Which is always key. Very quickly, what is the ultimate problem you're looking to solve? Okay, so for us, um, we've noticed, um, carrying out a bit of research, um, that a lot of um, young people within the age bracket of about 16 to 35, they they lack that savings culture, you know. So once money comes into your hands, all you want to do is just to spend it. So we are trying to help everyone to cultivate that habit okay. of ensuring that you, you have funds enough or something, you know, towards an emergency, you know, that might come up at yeah. any time. Fantastic. Which doesn't announce itself, actually. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Yemisi Bode Thorpe, CEO of Microvest, the fintech savings platform, and Professor Ola Yinka, David West, Associate Dean at Lagos Business School for talking about financial inclusion, fintech, and platform economies. Well, that's all we have time for on Business Week. Do have a lovely rest of the weekend online, but not before you join the conversation online. I'm Rolake Akinkubefilani, and I'll see you soon.